While the focus of emergent play is role-playing game theory, we need to discuss a little bit of psychology to truly get a better understanding here. So what do psychologists have to say about role-playing games? Well, there's a variety of theories out there, but most of them start with the magic circle. So the concept of the magic circle comes from a Dutch historian called Johan Huizinger. And of the magic circle, he had this to say. All play moves and has its being within a playground marked off beforehand, either materially or ideally, deliberately or as a matter of course. Just as there is no formal difference between play and ritual, so the consecrated spot cannot be formally distinguished from the playground. The arena, the card table, the magic circle, the temple, the stage, the screen, the tennis court, the court of justice, etc., are all in form and function playgrounds, i.e. forbidden spots, isolated, hedged around, hallowed, within which special rules obtain. All are temporary worlds within the ordinary world, dedicated to the performance of an act apart. To the average person, the most clear distinction of this would be going to a play. Obviously the actors are within their own magic circle, which they have to follow their scripts, and certain behaviors are expected of them. But the audience is also within a magic circle. They have the magic circle of accepting to believe what they are seeing on stage, and realizing that whenever there's a cut between sets and the curtain has come down, and the set has changed, that the wall has simply turned around, but they pretend that they are now looking into a different world. But there are less clear and obvious examples. Someone may be filling the role of a teacher in one part of their life, then they go home and play the role of a parent. And finally, with their spouse or significant other, they may play the role of husband. Of course there are game examples. In most classic Dungeons and Dragons games, you are accepting that you are living in a fantasy world with its own rules. You will accept that there are dragons, you may not accept that a level 1 fighter can kill one. So compare this with Fiasco, which may take place in a modern day setting very much like your own life. In both, you're playing a different role, but in Fiasco, the acceptance of the magic circle is more the consequences of your actions. In Fiasco, you don't care. If you're familiar with a book called Games People Play by Eric Byrne, you might also say that all life is a game because of the social rituals in which we engage. Indeed, even Huizinga said, even simple games create a magic circle. By studying the magic circle, we've also found certain things can help people enter it. For example, ritual can play a very large aspect of this. Think of your regular life. If you've gone to, for example, a live show, the performance of the band taking the stage and the hush coming over the crowd or the cheer rising from them may prepare you for the show and to enjoy it in a different way. Additionally, there are social roles that actually change as a result of rituals. The most classic we often see is a wedding. Some of you may already be thinking about the rituals you use at the start of games to help you get into character, as it can often be very difficult to jump straight into a game and feel immersed in your character. So that might simply be to recap the previous session, or in cases such as Fiasco, to use a playset to create the setting and develop relationships to the other players. For all the challenges we have in defining immersion, one thing is known to be true. You cannot be immersed in a setting without the magic circle. But what about being immersed in a character? Well, that's called framing, and we're going to cover that next week.